Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape Oil Painting Demonstration. This is your painter in residence. I'm Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is called Country Stream. It's an 8x12, and I did it yesterday. <laughs> I don't know if you'll be hearing this uh, yesterday. Today is uh, September 2nd, 2021. And um, how you doing? How you doing? Uh, we're going to keep the uh, conversation of painting today. Uh, suffice to say, I wanted to do an 8x10, but we're on um, L-O-C-K-D-O-W-N here. I can't get any boards. I can't get 8x10. So, um, you know, suffice to say, when we're out of it, I'm going to get me a bunch of every size. I have a, I have quite a lot of boards. I always like to have a bit around, but you never know. Things seem pretty random these days, so probably good to stock up. Uh, let's talk about this painting though. Okay, um, does it look familiar to you? Are, you? are you a follower of the channel? Do you remember the pigment series? That was this year. Seems like a while back, but I think it was this year. Yeah. Um, this was the same scene that I used for the demonstration of Dioazine Purple. Don't know if that's how you pronounce that purple. Don't mind. I've had people uh, correct me on the channel. Yeah, I don't I don't really care. I'm not going to memorize it. Uh, it's, you know, suffice to say, this weird chemical name. I, they should have given it a pretty name, like, uh, I don't know, Lake Purple or something like that. Purple Lake. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, you know, I've been looking for a good... It's a pictorialist. It's based on a pictorialist reference from uh, turn of the century. And um, I've just been in uh, sepia mode. What can I say? And... Uh, that's one thing I was sort of thinking about talking. Oh. Actually, before I get into that, let's talk about the pigments I used here. Because some of them are a bit different. So, uh, when I was doing the uh, sepia series uh, um, a while uh, back, probably about, what, five months ago now, six, something like that, um, I was on a you know, sepia mode full out. And... Um, dealing with uh, like uh, really transparency issues. I was trying to find some pigments that had some nice opacity and stuff and so I was bringing in uh, pigments from all over and I had brought in a couple tubes from uh, Rembrandt. One was on the recommendation of a great supporter of the channel Rich, uh, which was the um, the raw umber from Rembrandt and it is a very lovely color. It works just like raw umber. The one difference is it's a, it's a slow dryer and um, and Rich is uh, by his own admission a sort of slow painter so he finds having the uh, raw the regular raw umber on his palette really frustrating because it dries it dries the next day or so you know fortunately it's kind of a cheap pigment so you, you, you do end up throwing a bit away but I don't know what the trade-offs is for me if uh, out here in uh, New Zealand um, bringing in the Rembrandt uh, we had to come in internationally or something it was pretty expensive so not that interested in the Rembrandt but um, oh. uh, sorry I had to go check on boiling some eggs for my wife <laughs> um, yeah, so I brought in some other colors, though, since I had to bring in that. And um, uh, one of them was the brown ochre from Rembrandt, and the other was a color called sepia. Sepia, I think, is very much like your Van Dyke brown. Kind of a blackish, brownish color, very transparent. Nice color. I used that on this. And um, uh, most of all that underdrawing was done with that, not black. Um, but it has like it has like Mars black in it, and then like some synthetic versions of Earth pigments. Um, the, it looks like Rembrandt's decided to go synthetic across the boards on their Earth pigments, which is very interesting because a lot of times you might be just thinking you're working with a raw umber or whatever. It's not true raw umber. True raw umber has got a bit of grit to it. Not that much actually. It's more obvious with colors like um, the ochres. Romber can have grit, but it definitely has more grit than the, any of the modern uh, transparent versions. But um, actually, I say the Romber handles almost exactly the same, synthetic or not. So I don't have a real preference there. But I have to say, like uh, synthetic yellow ochre, synthetic uh, uh, raw sienna, of which I have a tube from um, 
Winsor Newton. They just don't act the same. I like that. There's a bit of a grit to the natural uh, versions, um, but uh, if you know their properties, in fact, uh, we're going to get around to telling you what I did in this painting and all the colors. So um, I used the Rembrandt uh, brown ochre, which was not like true brown ochre at all. The true brown ochre has a bit of grit, a bit of a chalky quality, um, less, uh, less chroma, less intensity in the color. Um, it is reddish, but it's not as reddish as the color I was using here. So you can really see that uh, Rembrandt um, brown ochre in the sky that uh, up in our uh, left there, that kind of reddish feel. That's that's that color almost straight up. Um, the other color is uh, that, that I used was I used lead white on this painting because that's what I had to hand. And every now and again, I just like to break out some lead white. Um, and you know me, I'm, I'm the king of the sidebar, so I'm going to be true to myself and just keep sidebarring. Hopefully you're, you know, enjoying watching the painting and just going along for the ride. But um, the, uh, what's the difference, you say, between uh, the lead white and the titanium white? Well, the titanium white's got a lot more opacity, for one. And one of the things that uh, distinguishes the lead white is the its ability to really hold strokes, you know. Um, you can hold strokes with your titanium white, but... Lead white wants to hold the stroke, so um, you can get a little more creative. And also, if you're really after an old-timey kind of look, definitely want to use the lead white, because nobody was using titanium white until the 20th century. You can get close, very close, with titanium white um, to you know getting you know the master kind of look, because let's face it, white you know is going to do a lot of the same things. Um, you just use really with titanium less of it and you get a lot more opacity so that actually created a bit more struggle but it also uh, it gives you less opacity the lead white but it gives you more give so that's a trade-off um, the yellow ochre that I used was this tube of old Holland uh, yellow ochre I just thought I'd try a premium one since I always use a cheap one it's uh, you can tell it's like from dirt somewhere more so than the uh, usually I use a Dale or Rowney Georgian yellow ochre uh, which was, works totally great, um, but again, I had the um, the uh, old Holland tube there, and I thought, well, I'll just use some of that, and I did a good job. Um, when we get to the uh, a little later on in the painting, and I start trying to bring it in um, opaque over wet other stuff, it it let me down. The, the ochre let me down altogether. Um, I was able to make a nice painting, though. I mean, that's the thing. The uh, and one of the reasons I always like to talk about the properties of paint and pigments is because you will be struggling with these properties. Say if you've got a very transparent pigment and you're trying to cover something um, and you don't want to use a really thick layer of paint, you're going to be struggling. Okay, that's just the fact. Um, so in your mixtures, it's good. Uh, and I mentioned this actually in the live um, the live version of this uh, painting session, which you can get access from my members area, which is uh, a little link underneath this video. Of, of the, just to digress, a whole members area is full of just the live versions, and I do these spit up 15 minute versions, which is what I've been doing on the channel for since the beginning. I started doing the live thing a while back, um, and then decided to do both. So I have got live stuff in the members area, and. Um, What's cool about that is, you know, you're listening to me as I'm uh, painting, and there's a lot of insights and things that, that come come uh, come around. Um, I try and share some of that here in the 15 minutes as well. But um, but I was uh, struggling with that yellow ochre to get that, uh, you know, thing. Where I felt the yellow ochre did help me was the opacity in the sky. And a lot of times you might lean into something like yellow ochre instead of white, because white, even the beautiful lead white will have a tendency to make things chalky. Now a certain amount of chalkiness, in fact chalkiness in the sky is not usually a problem. Um, you may make your whole painting chalky and then a, a, a workaround to that is to do maybe a quick glaze or something with something like transparent earth yellow from Gamblin. Um, anyway, um, you know, sidebar, 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 sidebar. You know me. Uh, but I really enjoyed doing this painting. And one of my briefs lately is like I had a 5x7 where I almost did the 5x7 because I couldn't find the 8x10 uh, prepped one. 
Um, but I was like, eh, I don't need another four by. I have so many five by sevens. I want something bigger. My goal lately has been to do um, something I might have done on a five by seven like this, um, in close to the same time. And what I'm finding is it's, you know, just a little bit longer. And um, as you scale, I think that's always a great goal. You know, if you, I'm always encouraging people that are learning painting to work fairly small but not exclusively small otherwise you'll fall into sort of the trap that I did yeah sorry about that those eggs were ready <laughs> um, yeah anyway I, a bit of a trap I fell into because I, I did pick up on that tip from uh, old Kevin McPherson you know 100 paintings 100 days 5 by 7 you know great idea great way to learn how to paint but you can get into this thing where it, when you want to start scaling up um, you know, there's a lot of things you miss, like the flick, with a flick of the wrist, at this size, or five by seven, or whatever, you get, you know, a bush, a, a bird, a stroke, uh, you can do that on the larger th scale as well, but, um, uh, to try and keep that immediacy, that fresh quality that the masters do when they scale up, I've, I found it to be a challenge, I have got around it, I feel r quite comfortable with the larger sizes now, um, but even if uh, being comfortable with the larger sizes, I like working fairly small, and I always will. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I always will. Um, one other big thing is, you know, it takes a heck of a lot less paint. Now, I am working on a uh, piece in the uh, in my little home studio. Um, it's going to be all blues. I'll be uh, uh, videotaping uh, that. I say videotape, you can tell I'm an old guy. I'll be videoing that and uh, sharing that on the channel. That should be pretty cool. Um... Anyway, uh, so we talked about opacity, transparency, and struggle. And so um, in this particular palette, I was using the last color I didn't mention. It took me a while, eh? Uh, Mars Black. Mars Black's great because it's um, it's opaque. And so it really helps like this, um, this uh, Sienna color from Rembrandt, which was super transparent. Kind of dark, but super transparent. Um, it was all, it was fu definitely functioning like a raw umber on the palette, no question. Um, that was transparent. The, uh, brown ochre, which should have had a little bit of opacity to it, had very little, uh, you know, the synth, there's Rembrandt's synthetic version of the brown ochre had very little opacity in it. And, uh, frankly, I way prefer the, um, the version I get from Old Holland. In fact, I've stocked up on that. I have like four or five tubes. Because uh, it, it does, it's not full out opaque to the same way that yellow ochre is not full out opaque, but it brings opacity to things without chalkiness, with less chalkiness. And I'm always having awareness of chalkiness. I don't really like too much chalkiness in my work. Um, so the brief here was to get it done uh, pretty rapidly, keep it expressive, and we're kind of getting to that part of the painting there where most of it's done, and we're doing little bits of this and that. Now those little bits of this and that can turn into the same length that I've spent doing the entire painting. We uh, would have been at around the hour mark um, in, in real time um, now, and so instead I'm just looking to clean things up so I can walk away with grace. <laughs> That's my approach, and uh, I've said it before, but you know, you might be new to the channel, and you might have just uh, dug, if you got it this far, thank you, um, you, you dig in uh, some information, you're writing some things down, and, and what have you, and what I could say to you is if you're just starting out, is like, uh, especially if you're just starting out, if you're an amateur painter, you're just, uh, you know, haven't done that many, um, an honest, expressive attempt at portraying a scene is worth way more than a belabored, uh, perfectionistic, uh, um, overwrought painting that you'll notice down the road was overworked and you killed it. And you'll remember all those nice little bits that you overworked to turn the expressive brushwork into a bunch of uh, rice grains. Don't do it. Don't do it. Anyway, I gotta go. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. Hope you're having a great um, day and a great life and getting some some nice painting done and um until i come back with another video do me a favor do me a solid take good care of yourself your family all your loved ones and uh be patient with people that um, are on a different page than yourself different wavelength or may know something you don't what have you 
Um, and uh, while you're doing all that, do me another favor and stay out of trouble. <laughs>